Funding for Overheard with Evan Smith is provided in part by Hilco Partners, Texas Government Affairs Consultancy, and its global healthcare consulting business unit, Hilco Health, and by the Matson McHale Foundation in support of public television, and also by MFI Foundation, improving the quality of life within our community, and also by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation. And viewers like you, thank you. I'm Evan Smith. This week, he's been a staff writer at The New Yorker since about the time that Richard Nixon exited the White House, establishing himself these many years as both the true master of the first-person narrative and the rare humorist who's actually funny. His fifth nonfiction book, Travels in Siberia, as sprawling and engrossing as its subject, has just been published. He's Ian Frazier. This is Overheard. Is that a vote you'd like to have back now? Because you're a judge, or a justice in your case, doesn't mean that you're free of, of personal opinions about that. You have a dimmer view of him than you have of presidents past. So when they take your name in vain, you just laugh it off. For the larger issue, though, in your mind, is that it's not about whether there ought to be a death penalty, but whether the death penalty as administered is fair. Ian Frazier, welcome. Thanks for having me. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you also. Why Siberia? Um, I think it was partly the result of a previous book that I did about the Great Plains. Um, there are a lot of connections between the Great Plains and Siberia. And also, um, I'm from Ohio, and I like to go west. People in America traditionally move west gone to Texas, you know, GTT, people yeah. used to write on their doors of Indeed. their cabins in Ohio and they'd just be gone, gone to Texas. Yeah. Well, I would just um, go west and I just kept going. That's thought, pretty west. You know, right, yeah. I mean, why stop at the Pacific? Yeah. And, and there's a wilderness or something very much like a wilderness on the other side, why not explore it? Yeah. And that also, I just have a, a passion for Russia, which I can't really explain. It took a long time for this book to come together. You did 16 years of research, is that right? Right. I started the book in 1993 with a trip, uh, right after sort of it opened up in Russia. So, uh, it, with, with an eye to doing a book, or just an no? Eye to I just went with. Fr I had friends. I um, friends with people who came over from Russia in the 70s and 80s. And they were going back. They had been able, finally, you know, then by then they were American citizens by 93, right. and they were able to go back. And I went back with them. So I saw Siberia. I saw Russia. I was just fascinated with it. I came home. I started to learn Russian. I read all kinds of books about Russia and about Siberia. So I just became fascinated and then worked over, you're right, 16 years. And, and, and at what point in that process, was it after the first trip or was it further down the road that you thought, you know, there's a book in this? It was after the first trip. Yeah. And I came back, my uh, publisher, Roger Strauss, who died some years ago, uh, I went out to lunch with him after I'd come back and I started talking about Siberia and he was so excited about it. And I thought, I can get a book advance. So... Uh, yeah, often the big motivation, right? <laughs> hey, they're gonna, they'll pay me some money about that. Right. Si Siberia has become over the years, for people who have never been and will never go, this code word for isolation, right. or for, you know, it's the, we're gonna make you disappear. Right. We're gonna right. send you to Siberia. But right. people don't fully appreciate probably the nuance, the, the complexity of what Siberia actually is. Well, it's like America in that it exists as a concept in your mind, right. you know, and as a geographic location. So. You know, there are, par there are parts of restaurants, for example, that are the restaurants Siberia, you right. know? So it has this... If you're I, out of fashion, we put you over, right. we you're put in you in Siberia. Siberia. Right, yeah. Uh, and um, that is a very powerful... Uh, it, to me, it's just fascinating where, where there's a name of a place that you can say it and it conjures up all this, uh, all these thoughts in your mind because it gives you something to play against when you go there as a traveler. You right. know, you have something already in your mind and then you see what it's really like. Uh, and in this case, it couldn't have been, a, 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 I mean, a, it's not a very positive connotation. No, mind, it's right? not. I mean, it's funny because we have the idea of the American West and we had our Wild West. They had their Wild East. You know, hmm. they had also a kind of uh, as we went west, they went east, and there are many parallels to the history of the American West and the history of Siberia. But Siberia, I mean, the American West is like a mirage. You're always pursuing something, but there's something very hopeful about it. It's like you're going, 
you're riding off into the sunset is a yeah. hopeful thing. Uh, whereas for Russians, looking eastward is a much more, uh, there's more ambivalence because, you know, the Mongols came out of the east. Mm -hmm. They came out of Siberia. Uh, being sent that way by the czars was, you know, it was exile. Going east for them was this, you know, it, 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 could, be, uh, it could be disaster. But it's also what made Russia, Russia. Before Russia expanded into Asia, it was just uh, these sort of principalities around mm -hmm. cities like Moscow. Uh, by expanding eastward, Russia became an empire. You know, many empires involved, most involved sailing right. somewhere, but Russia just sort of expanded into this huge part of Asia, and uh, it's a very important part of their identity. When you went the first time, what were your expectations for what you would encounter, and did you meet them or exceed them or... Well, I thought, I thought it was going to be, uh, I guess, uh, bleaker than it was. I went to Lake Baikal uh, the first time, and a lot of people have traveled to Baikal, and it's really beautiful. Lake Baikal is an incredible lake, and uh, it was a resort. I mean, now it was not what we would think of exactly as a resort, but it was, um, it was nice. And that, that surprised me. Well, off the uh, bat, to think of any place in Siberia, again, given the concept in the mind's eye. Right, right as Siberia. a resort. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a place people went to, you know, for, for uh, the summer, and they would swim, and they would fish. I mean, it was like going to, you know, uh, like going to the beach, sort of. And I never quite imagined that it would be like that. Now, Lake Baikal is really cold. I don't know how people swim in it. Well, that part of the Siberian uh, notion is probably accurate. That right? is yeah. accurate. Siberia yeah. is still cold. It's indeed cold. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's livable. Um, well, yeah. I think it's uh, parts of it, I, I would say, are very tough to live in. Um, Western Siberia is very, very swampy, the, like the largest swamps in the world. And there are a lot of mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, I love to travel out west. I love horizon and, and huge sky, and there's plenty of that there. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, for that, it's, it's, uh, it's really beautiful. The and notion of the similarities between the American West, that, that actually, I think, is something that, that's great. I get that right away. 